G'day guys, in this video I derived the conservation of mechanical energy for a one-dimensional system. It involves a little bit of calculus, but it's not too heavy. And at the very end of the video, I spend a little bit of time describing the difference between a conservative force and a non-conservative force. I hope you like it. Alright, let's assume we have a simple one-dimensional system with the following equation of motion. M x double dot, that's your mass times acceleration, is equal to your external forces acting on your particle, f of x. Now I'm keeping f incredibly generic, I'm just saying it's some function of position just here. And my aim for this video will be to prove that from this equation of motion, this very general equation of motion, we can derive the conservation of mechanical energy. So to do this we're going to need a little bit of help. I'm going to define a new function v of x by the following relationship. dv dx is equal to minus f of x. This seems completely arbitrary, but bear with me. If we just go ahead with this definition, v of x will become somewhat intuitive towards you by the end of the video. Okay, so just using this definition now, let's plug it into this equation of motion and see what we get. We're going to get mx double dot, bring the f to the other side, plus dv dx is equal to zero, right? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do something even more random. I'm going to multiply both the left-hand side and the right-hand side by x dot. And that's going to give me mx dot, sorry, mx dot times x double dot plus x dot times dv dx is equal to zero times x dot, which is zero. Now, this also seems like a very strange expression, but rest assured, both of these terms individually can be simplified. So let me just consider this expression in green just here, m x dot x double dot. I'm going to propose to you that this can actually be written as d dt of a half m x dot squared. And if you don't believe me, let's see that, th let's differentiate this guy and prove it. This will be a half times by m, suck out the constants, then differentiate x dot squared with respect to x dot. That's just going to be 2x dot. And then differentiate x dot with respect to time. And that's going to be x double dot. That's just using the chain rule. And if we cross out the halves, we're going to get m x dot x double dot just here. So we've proven it. We've proven that m x dot times x double dot is equal to this expression. Let me write it below. This is the exact same thing as d dt times a half m x dot squared, okay? Now let's consider this expression just here. This expression, x dot times dv dx, is actually the same thing as dx dt times dv dx. Cancel off the dx's and we're left with dv dt. Or another way of writing that is d dt of v of x, like this. So if we write this in here, this is going to be d dt of v of x, like this. And of course, we've got a plus here, and that's equal to zero. Now, I think you know where I'm going with this. I'm going to group the dt's together. This is going to be d dt of a half m x dot squared plus v of x is equal to zero. Now I'm going to integrate both sides, and what I'm going to get is a half m x dot squared plus v of x plus some integrational constant is going to be equal to zero. And I'm going to write that integrational constant on the right hand side, and I'm going to write that as e. Now we don't know what that integrational constant is, but by sheer fact that it is a constant makes the world of difference. And let me explain to you why. I'm going to define this term just here, a half m x dot squared, as t. So I'm going to define t to be a half m x dot squared, and I'm going to call it something called kinetic energy. Kinetic energy. So if you have a particle and it's moving and it's got some velocity x dot, then this term is something we will call kinetic energy. Likewise, I'm going to call this term v, which we defined up here, as potential energy. P 
potential energy. And lastly, I'm going to define the sum of kinetic energy plus potential energy as mechanical mechanical energy, right? And notice, this is the kicker. The sum of kinetic plus potential energy, which is by definition mechanical energy, must be conserved. It's equal to a constant. It must be conserved. So to illustrate this, to take this away from abstract mathematics, consider we've got a ball, right? And we're dropping it, right? That's a simple one dimensional system, right? We can say that mechanical energy in this whole process must be conserved, right? The kinetic energy and potential energy of the ball in this position, the sum of that must be equal to the kinetic energy plus the potential energy of the ball in this position. So the kinetic energy in this position, T1, plus the potential energy in this position, let's call it V1, is equal to E. Likewise, we can say the kinetic energy in this position, T2, plus the potential energy in this position, call it V2, must be equal to that same E. There is a conservation of mechanical energy. I can't hammer this down enough. No matter what, there's going to be this conservation just here, right? And it's true that if you wanted to, you could actually um, write this in another kind of cute way. You could actually say, well, a half times mx1 dot squared, so that's your kinetic energy of your ball in, say, this position, plus your potential at that same position, must be equal to that constant. Likewise, you can say a half times by m times x2, that's your kinetic energy in your second position, plus v of x2, must be equal to e. And if you use substitution formulas and get rid of that E, you can prove that the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy must be equal to zero, right? So that's another way of expressing the conservation of mechanical energy just here. Now I could end the video here, but I feel like I'd be snaking away without telling you all the subtle details. We have actually very subtly assumed that our external force was purely a function of position exclusively. And from that, we derived the conservation of mechanical energy. In principle, though, that might not be true. You could have forces which are, say, a function of position, speed, and maybe time explicitly. And if our total forcing is this expression, then I promise you, you will not be able to prove this result. It just can't happen, right? And, and I pr try, try the calculus, you won't be able to do it, right? And so we can say that conservation of mechanical energy only occurs when we have a force which is purely a function of position, something we call a conservative a conservative force, right? Or also known as a path independent force because it's only a function of position, not the path it went on. Likewise, we could define this type of forcing as a non-conservative force, non-conservative force, or maybe path dependent force, right? So just to reiterate, the conservation of mechanical energy only occurs if we have a conservative force acting on our system, right? And I'll be, I might make a video elaborating on these differences in a little bit more detail in the future. All right, so that's this video done, guys. Um, maybe in another video, I'll be proving this in the more general case of 2D motion. I hope you liked it. Cheers.